All right, welcome everyone. Good afternoon and hello. Welcome to today's event, Tackling Substance Use in Health Centers, Crystal Meth and HIV. The duration of this webinar is approximately 60 minutes, including introductions, presentations, and a Q&A segment at the end. This event is sponsored by the National Association of Community Health Centers. My name is Emily Scott. I'm the Specialist Administrative Operations based in our Clinical Affairs Division. And my colleagues and I are very pleased to bring you this webinar today. Before we get start started, let's just review a few housekeeping items. Just a quick reminder that today's event is being recorded. Individual participants are welcome to record this webinar on their own device as well. Recordings and materials exchanged during today's event will be shared with the participants and others after the event. Please note that the content shared today is the viewpoint of presenters and may not fully reflect the opinions of NAC. By staying in today's webinar, you are automatically consenting to being recorded. You have joined this online event by calling in or using your computer audio. If you are in an in an area with spotty Wi-Fi or having trouble with computer audio connection, we do recommend you call in using your phone. All attendee lines have been automatically muted for the duration of this event, and the video for attendees has been disabled as well. If at any time during this event you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please use the Q&A box feature located at the bottom of your screen. You can also select send anonymously if you do not want your name attached to your question. To submit your comments and questions, please select send to all panelists, type in your question or comment and click send. Your message will be viewed by all panelists. The panelist team will attempt to answer your questions as soon as possible. If we cannot answer your question in the time allotted, we will follow up with you post webinar with the response. Q&A will be answered after all presentations are complete. And let us remind you with a few friendly reminders that today's event is being recorded and will be sent out after the event with the next week or so. And now I will turn things over to our clinical data scientist, Pedro, who will be introducing our speakers. Pedro, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much, Emily. Hi, everyone. I'm Pedro Carneiro. Like Emily said, I'm from the Clinical Affairs Division. I'm very glad to be uh, hosting it, this webinar about this uh, subject that is so important to community health centers um, and uh, the patients that attend them. So um, I just want to introduce our panelists. Uh, the first is Dr. Adam Carrico. He's at the uh, Florida International University. Uh, and then we're going to have Alex Garolian, who uh, works very closely with NAC, and it's at Fenway Health, which is a community health center located in Boston. Uh, and without further ado, I'll pass it over to Adam, and you can um, let us know when to change the slide. Thanks, Pedro. Thank you. So I'm in the middle of transitioning uh, universities. I have my uh, University of Miami seal here. I started FIU uh, on July 5th. Um, so I just wanted to take a bit of time and I'm so glad to be able to have this opportunity uh, to talk about these intertwining uh, epidemics of meth use and HIV. Um, oftentimes I think of this as a back to the future kind of phenomenon where we're back to the early 2000s where we had that first wave uh, of the methamphetamine epidemic and the recognition uh, that it was driving new infections. Um, and so we can go to the next slide. So, you know, uh, there by any uh, by many estimates, meth is back. Uh, we've seen increases and in a resurgent uh, meth epidemic in New York City. Um, although this time there's evidence that it's uh, disproportionately impacting ethnic minority men. Uh, increases in meth uh, use uh, in the past several years uh, in Black and Latino sexual minority men with concurrent declines in white sexual minority men. And I would caution folks uh, that this is New York City data. Uh, we're not seeing the same data in sexual and gender minority youth in Chicago. Uh, where there is an increase among uh, white uh, youth in particular, uh, but these data were reported by Rivera and colleagues. 
Um, so, you know, regardless of how this is differentially impacting uh, racial and ethnic groups, uh, we know that meth is on the rise. Uh, and really, meth exposure is potentiated through these uh, romantic and sexual networks that men uh, often form on geosocial networking apps like Grindr. Uh, so you see over here the meth pipe with the Grindr logo in the middle. Uh, Grindr has really become a platform, and other geosocial networking apps, I don't want to pick on Grindr specifically, uh, have become platforms where men can uh, actively seek out partners uh, to party and play or P and P. Uh, this has also become a global phenomenon. Uh, in Thailand, we see uh, high fun. Um, in Europe, we see chemsex. People will often do the capital T to let you know that they're using Tina, or they'll even talk about slamming or injecting meth. We see about half of our guys with HIV uh, are actively injecting. And beyond coded language, there uh, are emoticons like the balloon for partying, uh, the dartboard for injecting, uh, flowers for men that are exchanging sex for money or drugs, and so on and so forth. Um, and you know, once again, uh, we're seeing data uh, from various sources, uh, but recent data from Christian Grove's T5K cohort uh, showed that one in three new HIV infections over 12 months uh, were among uh, meth users. Uh, so uh, it is a persistent and recurrent driver of the epidemic. Um, and a lot of uh, my work that I won't talk about today is just that there are persistent gaps in our understanding of these neuroimmune mechanisms linking meth and HIV. So a lot of related work that we do is trying to inform the development of pharmacotherapies uh, in this population. Next slide. And you know, when we think about pharmacotherapies for methamphetamine use disorder, um, it, this is really still in its infancy. Uh, there are currently no FDA approved pharmacotherapies for any stimulant use disorder, including cocaine uh, use disorder, but there are several RCTs that have shown promise uh, for uh, a few pharmacotherapies. Uh, the first is oral uh, mirtazapine uh, and uh, or geodon, um, and uh, that has uh, shown uh, benefits in two trials. Uh, the second is oral bupropion, uh, an antidepressant with uh, injectable naltrexone, uh, and that was uh, recently published in this Trevetti article in NEJM. Um, I should mention that these RCTs often involve extensive counseling, so uh, there really is no magic bullet for um, chronic relapsing uh, methamphetamine use disorder. We're often testing integrated packages where things like cognitive behavioral therapy and other behavioral interventions are being delivered with these medications to meet a minimum standard of care. Um, adherence remains a major concern for oral uh, medications. We see around 40% adherence in these placebo-controlled trials. It's hard to know what that would be like in real-world uh, settings. Uh, and finally, um, the reductions that we see in stimulant use and methamphetamine use in particular are modest, uh, around 10% in the Trivedi uh, trial. So while these are making a dent in a complex problem, um, they're one important uh, component of uh, comprehensive approaches. Um, many people are seeking out these medications off label, uh, and I think that's something interesting uh, that Alex and others can uh, fill us in on. And next slide. So, you know, at this time, behavioral therapies uh, really should be considered first line treatments for methamphetamine use disorder. Uh, evidence is strongest for uh, the big three uh, contingency management, uh, which is essentially peeing for dollars. Uh, where individuals receive small uh, cash rewards or other tangible incentives uh, for documented evidence of stimulant abstinence. Um, other work has uh, supported motivational interviewing uh, with sexual uh, minority men, uh, so usually uh, brief two to four session uh, interventions uh, targeting intrinsic motivation to uh, reduce or abstain from uh, substance use, or even set harm reduction goals like um, having uh, safer sex or adhering to PrEP uh, during uh, risky uh, events of meth use. Uh, and last, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, this has largely uh, been done uh, by a group at UCLA testing the matrix model. Uh, it's a comprehensive 16-week approach that includes individual, group, uh, and urine testing. Uh, so it's a, a very intensive uh, treatment. Um, you know, the uh, cognitive behavioral therapy has been adapted for a harm reduction approach, as well as contingency management. Uh, and so we've documented 
uh, the implementation of those interventions with our partners uh, at the Stonewall Project at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Uh, and I think the exciting part about those treatments is, you know, not really demanding the individuals be ready, willing, and able to achieve abstinence to deserve treatment. Uh, there are a number of different goals that we can help people uh, address along that spectrum of substance use. It could be their mode of administration, it could be their frequency of use, uh, duration. Uh, there are all sorts of excellent behavioral targets uh, that we can uh, agree on uh, and pursue with patients, even if they're not willing to be abstinent. Uh, next slide. And so, you know, we, when we think about harm reduction, um, Steve Shoptaw has a lovely article called Not Just the Needle. Uh, and we often need to think of uh, substance use disorders and HIV, of course, uh, in a social, cultural, and structural context. Um, many times, uh, substance use and addiction are a symptom um, of exposure to uh, discrimination, urban poverty, uh, other you know, chronic uncontrollable stressors that we know at least fuel people's uh, use or continued use of substances. Um, and we often need uh, you know, comprehensive biomedical approaches such as TREP, uh, PrEP and treatment as prevention. Uh, at this point, you know, intervention literature on harm reduction is in its nascent stages, uh, feasibility and acceptability studies, although NIDA is actively funding harm reduction trials now, which is really uh, exciting. Um, but uh, work that's underway, um, you know, in the HPTN, the HIV Prevention Trials Network, is looking at uh, mobile units with kind of comprehensive services uh, where they're delivering uh, substance use uh, disorder treatment, including pharmacotherapies for opioid use disorders, mental health uh, counseling, and HCV treatment. Uh, so testing these comprehensive mobile packages that can reach people in the communities where they reside uh, and use uh, substances without having them uh, go into a brick and mortar clinic where they may feel increased stigma as well. Um, other work by our team and others has really been focused on adapting uh, evidence-based uh, behavioral uh, intervention approaches uh, such as uh, MI contingency management for uh, optimizing the HIV care continuum and PrEP. Uh, next slide. So the work today I'll present is from our Artemis project. Uh, we were fortunate to be funded for this in 2012, which really uh, was the onset of HIV treatment as prevention, the uh, groundbreaking studies, uh, HPTN 063, I think, uh, by, or 062, uh, by the uh, HIV Prevention Trials Network. And it really showed that uh, early HIV treatment has a double benefit. Uh, it uh, achieves viral suppression and reduces risk of onward transmission and optimizes health outcomes of people living with HIV. And so our goal in Artemis was to test a, a comprehensive behavioral model to address meth use to see if that could uh, help individuals uh, get or stay uh, virally suppressed. Uh, next slide. So the base of all this was a community-based contingency management program. So it was the platform uh, from which we delivered our experimental intervention. And contingency management is uh, wildly successful and uh, hopelessly underutilized in our country and others. Uh, so it leverages uh, behavioral principles such as positive reinforcement, uh, where individuals receive tangible incentives for performing a variety of health behaviors, uh, including uh, abstaining from substance use. It has moderate uh, effect sizes, a Cohen's D of 0.66 uh, for reductions in stimulant use from a Prendergast uh, meta-analysis. And in HIV, we see that um, CM achieves uh, short-term reductions in viral load, but after the incentives end, um, people uh, rebound more rapidly, or we see those uh, benefits of uh, the CM decay. So what we were interested with the Stonewall Project operating this contingency management program uh, was testing a behavioral intervention uh, targeting positive affect to really uh, boost and ext extend the benefits of contingency management. Next slide. So why positive affect? Um, it sounds a little hippy dippy sometimes, maybe a little, um, you know, integrative uh, and uh, meditative. Uh, so you know, I, I like to say that this is really rooted in our understanding of uh, two fundamental neurobehavioral uh, deficits in people with substance use disorders. Uh, the first is withdrawal. We know that undergoing contingency management or trying to uh, 
change one's relationship with methamphetamine uh, produces predictable uh, increases in depression and other forms of negative affect. So people need help coping with that during contingency management. Uh, one of the saddest things about substance use disorders is not only that people are hyper-responsive to drug-related cues, but they experience persistent anhedonia and a decreased responsivity, even in the scanner, uh, to natural sources of reward, even primary reinforcers like food, sex, and money. Um, so really the idea here was to test a positive emotion intervention, a five session treatment uh, that could uh, help manage withdrawal, but also change the payer mix of people's reward system and bring their uh, natural sources of reward and reinforcement back online to sensitize them uh, to these uh, natural sources of reward and reinforcement. And this is based on a prior trial uh, led by my postdoc mentor, Judy Moskowitz, uh, where she found that this positive affect intervention was helpful in uh, newly diagnosed people with HIV. So it reduced HIV-specific distress and antidepressant use. Uh, next slide. So the take home of Artemis was that, you know, we conducted this RCT of the positive affect intervention. Uh, it's called Affect Regulation Treatment to Enhance Meth Intervention Success. Um, we're fond of acronyms in research, so, you know, we have to find cool ones. Uh, we compared that to an attention control condition that really just completed uh, self-report measures and neutral writing exercises, like, you know, tell me without any emotion what you did today or what you did in the last week, uh, as if you were writing a newspaper article. And both of these uh, uh, experimental conditions were delivered during 12 weeks of contingency management, where individuals provided urine screens thrice weekly uh, to test for stimulants and got uh, uh, cash or uh, monetary rewards. Uh, overall, we randomized 110 uh, sexual minority men with biologically confirmed meth use. So everyone had to give us a, a positive urine screen or have a positive hair screen for methamphetamine uh, to meet the criteria for enrollment. Uh, the major surprise for us as a team, and I think this reflects the advent of integrase strand transfer inhibitor medications and how good they are at achieving viral suppression at lower levels of adherence, um, we found very uh, low prevalence of unsuppressed viral load at baseline. Uh, and granted, this was conducted in San Francisco, which is also a very special place, uh, but only 14% of our participants uh, had unsuppressed viral load uh, at baseline. And you see the take home here is that the Artemis positive affect intervention was really able to help people stay uh, suppressed. We maintain that baseline level uh, of viral suppression pretty much. It, only 15% of the Artemis guys um, had uh, one or more um, unsuppressed viral loads over a 15 month follow up. And this is in stark contrast to our attention controls where there was a 46% uh, uh, rate of any unsuppressed viral load uh, over follow-up. Um, so this really underscores that people need help getting suppressed, but also staying suppressed. And it also reflects the, I think, chronic wash, rinse, repeat nature of substance use disorders that we're not going to just address this with a brief intervention and be done. Uh, people need ongoing support uh, to maximize their own health and well-being from a uh, mental health and substance use perspective, but also to optimize HIV prevention. Uh, next slide. So we're taking this into uh, different populations now or different uh, trials. Uh, one is a mHealth application called START. Uh, so you see here in the wisdom wallet, we've packaged all the different Artemis skills. I'm happy to chat about that. We have dissemination activities that are ongoing with Alex and we're happy to share these uh, intervention um, you know, kind of uh, manuals and participant manuals, but it's just a variety of positive affect skills uh, that individuals can complete, uh, including mindfulness and self-compassion, formal meditation exercises, um, acts of kindness, um, positive reappraisal. It's a, a large buffet of skills, and we really hope that per, by providing an array of skills, there are at least one or two things that people will find helpful uh, in increasing positive emotion. Uh, the other major focus of the START app is self-monitoring. So individuals self-monitor their adherence. You see in the circles there um, how, what proportion of their meds they've taken over a given period, as well as their mood check-ins, positive versus negative. Uh, we also have people rate their mood. 
Um, and, you know, coincidentally, I think the modal uh, mood response that I get from this population is bored. Uh, and I think it reflects the fundamental kind of anhedonia that uh, individuals experience, especially when they're coming down. Um, and so uh, I, I just find that clinically interesting. Uh, we're measuring uh, viral load through mail-in dried blood spot samples over 12 months. Uh, our primary outcome is detectable viral load at six months, because uh, we don't think an app is enough to change the course of viral load forever, uh, but we're hoping it makes a dent in that uh, process. And this will be one tool uh, that could be more broadly applied and reach guys, uh, especially outside of major urban centers uh, where uh, there's more culturally competent care. And next slide. We're also replicating uh, or extending these results into PrEP adherence. Uh, and so uh, this time we're uh, delivering a party, uh, which is a PrEP uh, affect regulation treatment innovation. innovation. Uh, so uh, party is being paired up with CM again versus an attention control. This time we're doing contingency management using eMOCA. Uh, so it's a cell phone application that guys log into and they uh, take videos of themselves taking their PrEP. Uh, where they adhere to their prep uh, four days uh, a week or more, they get a bonus. So we're trying to promote prevention effective prep adherence for sexual minority men. Uh, that's the level at which we know uh, it's maximized. And so the goal is to see can those that receive the party intervention achieve more durable improvements in PrEP adherence at three, six, and 12 months uh, using tenofovir diphosphate levels uh, through dried blood spots. Uh, our primary outcome for this is HIV acquisition risk. So it's the occurrence of condomless uh, anal sex when PrEP adherence is uh, below 700 uh, mol micromole or whatever the level uh, is for uh, prevention effective adherence. Next slide. And that's it. I just want to um, acknowledge all of our collaborators, including the Stonewall Project uh, in particular, um, also AIDS Healthcare Foundation, who I uh, neglected to put up, and just all our uh, mentors and collaborators that make this uh, work possible. Next slide. Uh, we'll hold questions for the end, but I love my I love designing question slides that have some of these cool uh, public health campaigns around uh, addressing meth as a, a persistent problem in our community. Thanks. And Alex, it's all you. Thank you so much, Adam. Hi, everybody. Great to be with you all today. Thank you so much to NAC for organizing this uh, webinar on this very important topic. And I'm so pleased to be paired with a colleague I admire uh, greatly, Dr. Adam Carrico, who just shared with you all the amazing innovation he and his uh, group and colleagues have uh, conducted toward intervention development to address methamphetamine use disorders in our communities. I'm going to be talking about meth use from a particularly clinical standpoint and talking a bit about um, how we would apply some of the uh, work that Dr. Carrico and his team have, have done as well. Next slide, please. Great. Next slide. Thank you. Word about Fenway Health. As Pedro mentioned, we're a federally qualified health center in downtown Boston. From the beginning, Fenway Health has been focused on providing care for sexually and gender diverse patients. Once the HIV epidemic hit in the 80s, that certainly became our primary focus of what we do. We're now the largest provider of certainly LGBTQ plus health services in New England and of transgender and gender diverse healthcare. We see over 4,500 trans and gender diverse people in primary medical care each year. And we're the largest provider of HIV services in New England as well. We see 2,300 people living with HIV uh, in primary care each year. Next slide, please. We have a lot of resources on our website at our First of your primary health care funded National LGBTQI plus Health Education Center. This is a national training and technical assistance partnership specifically to uh, provide training, technical assistance, capacity building, um, implementation support at health centers across the country. We work with health centers and PCAs. A lot of educational resources you can check out at lgbtqiahealtheducation.org, including around substance use disorders uh, and HIV. Next slide, please. Now, what is crystal meth? The name of this compound is uh, methamphetamine. It looks like rock candy. It can be used in a variety of ways. It can be snorted with a rush that can last three to five minutes, injected intravenously with a rush lasting, say, five to 10 minutes. It can be swallowed with a rush lasting longer, up to 30 minutes. It can be rectally inserted with variable duration of this rush. And 
the high can last anywhere from four to say 16 hours after use. Next slide, please. What's causing this rush? There's a massive release of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin, various neurotransmitters that are um, part of reward circuits in the moment, increased release of dopamine and then increased accumbens, which is part of reward center of the brain. And physiologically, people experience increases in heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature through use. Next slide, please. What does it cost to use meth? Many people don't have to pay, can often be freely available at parties, for example. It's often exchanged for sex in a transactional context. It can be sold in smaller amounts that don't really cost much money. Um, says here lowest $20, even lower than that these days. So the financial toll for meth use is really related to the impaired judgment that results from methamphetamine use disorder rather than the cost of the drug itself. So it's like, as a result of using, you may not make the best financial decisions or you may lose your job because you're not functioning at the same level that you used to. Next slide, please. Focusing on crystal meth use among men who have sex with men, as, as Adam did, there's thought to be around 10 times more use of crystal meth among men who have sex with men than the general population, and prevalence anywhere from 12 to 30% among men who have sex with men. There's increased pleasure during sex with meth use, um, very high uh, incidence of meth use at circuit parties where men will have sex, loss of inhibition, as there can be a lot of uh, weight loss, which is actually um, a side effect in some cases and part of what's motivating for others to use, increased alertness, and also a way that people try to cope with issues of aging and ageism in the community. Next slide, please. With meth use, sex can last longer. With delays in ejaculation, there can be certain um, undesired side effects like erectile dysfunction and therefore increased use of sildenafil and other medications for erectile dysfunction. There's uh, disinhibition behaviorally that results from meth use that can lead to rougher sex, more rectal trauma as, as a result and more trauma to the penis and other body parts, often more sex partners in the context of meth use than someone would otherwise engage with, and more um, condomless intercourse or intercourse in the uh, sexual activity in the absence of adequate HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis adherence as well. Next slide, please. Here's some of the comments we hear from older uh, men who use meth. It's the best sex I've ever had. I'm not old and invisible when I use meth. I love my partner, but we met when shoulder pads were in style. This may not apply so much anymore because I think shoulder pads have come back into style of late. Um, younger guys are now interested in me. I know it's the drugs, but when you're high, it feels real. So there's, as in society, a major um, problem with ageism in uh, gay and queer communities. And this is a way that people will often feel more vital or more uh, relevant within um, sexual and intimate networks in that way. Next slide, please. Meth also has appeal for people living with HIV. People report not having to worry about rejection based on their HIV status. Um, people describe burnout on safer sex and crystal meth use often is associated with condomless intercourse or sex without prep, as I was mentioning earlier. So this disinhibition kind of serves an avoiding function for many folks. Next slide, please. And, you know, there's this fine line that's hard to really identify between recreation and substance use disorder when it comes to meth. Not everyone who uses crystal meth becomes physiologically dependent. There are people who use who, um, you know, don't develop a physiologic inability to, to stop. Some people may not escalate in use. And um, despite that, even if you're not escalating in use when you do use, it's common for people to have less safe sex while using. Many people will go for long periods without escalating use and then stop. Some people will use for a long period of time and gradually increase use and much further down the road have that kind of escalation or physiologic dependence. And yet other people, may develop addiction really quickly, like, you know, pretty soon after initiating. Next slide, please. There are different patterns of increase in crystal meth use. Some people may start by using on weekends, and then, you know, next thing you know, at one point, they're using during the weekdays and during the work week. Extended periods of heavy use often occur, so there may be periods of using intensively and then periods of using less periods of increased sexual risk with use, as I mentioned earlier. 
Um, and the type of sexual behaviors may be more intense or higher risk in some ways, increasing the number of partners or just physically um, rougher sex as well. People living with HIV may start to miss antiretroviral medications that they previously were very adherent to. Others may start missing taking PrEP for prevention of HIV. People may start missing work over time and constantly having to cover up their use in that context because they're not meeting the responsibilities that they um, have in their life otherwise. Next slide, please. A word about crystal meth and sexually transmitted infections other than HIV. At parties where crystal meth is used, multiple partners is really uh, common, it can be the norm. Um, syphilis is something that can commonly be transmitted. This can involve a painful lesion, primary lesion on the tonsil or in the rectum, maybe something that's often not seen. So people may not um, you know, um, find this to be visible in the context of a sex party, for example. This is also the setting in which there's thought to have been some evolution of gonorrhea resistant to cyprofloxacin as well within the community. And there is an aggressive form of chlamydia called lymphogranuloma venereum that also has been seen in these contexts of um, sex parties with meth. Also transmitted in these contexts is methicillin resistant staph aureus, which is quite hard to treat with antibiotics and definitely transmission of HIV as well as hepatitis. Next slide, please. A little more about crystal meth and hep C. Increased risk of transmission with injecting or slamming meth. More traumatic sex also increases the likelihood of transmission. Sharing bumpers and straws with snorting of meth is a way to transmit as well. There can also be possible increases in cognitive deficits with the combination of crystal meth, hepatitis C, and HIV. More than any one of those things would cause on their own. And that's separate from how advanced liver disease may be from hepatitis. So there can be kind of a uh, worse effect with the combination of these in terms of cognitive functioning. Crystal meth is also thought to um, adversely impact engagement in care for hepatitis C. So there's you know, excellent treatment now, but the ability of the person to engage in treatment can be compromised by active crystal meth use. Next slide, please. There are certain early negative health effects of meth use, like becoming more paranoid, having certain delusions, so becoming psychotic, having um, auditory hallucinations or other types of sensory hallucinations, for example. There can be pretty quickly um, depression after the high from meth has gone as well. There can also be serotonin syndrome when mixed with other club drugs, club drugs that are serotonergic or synaptic serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are uh, psychiatric medications that are first line treatment for depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. So meth combined with this very commonly used category of psychiatric medications can lead to this um, really dangerous and potentially fatal serotonin, serotonin syndrome as well. There can be pretty early in use and really at any point, uh, some dire vascular consequences like stroke, myocardial infarction, or colitis. And there can also be seizure related to overheating. So really early on, some very high risk um, health problems can, can emerge. Next slide, please. We then think about negative health effects that can emerge with more chronic use. There can be persistent psychiatric problems like persistent psychosis that often last, I've seen, cases in the hospital of active psychosis lasting for weeks and weeks after someone discontinued meth use, which is pretty alarming. There can be persistent memory deficits, dental decay related to decreased saliva, grinding of teeth, increased consumption of sugar in the context of meth use. There can be uh, really bad skin effects due to skin picking called you know, crystal bumps from using erectile dysfunction that doesn't improve for example, uh, muscle wasting, some real atrophy on that front, and psychosocially, some really profound damage to relationships, a person's occupation, and finances as well. Next slide, please. Now, how do we address crystal meth use in clinical care? Well, it's challenging when the reimbursement structures that support our provision of healthcare, primary medical and mental health care at health centers um, kind of constrains us to 20 minute follow-up visits, right? That's not really a very luxurious amount of time to be able to address everything we have to address with our clients, including their meth use. So it, the reality is that it's challenging in any given visit to solve all of a person's health problems. We wanna avoid arguing with patients about their meth use. That's just gonna make them more resistance within a motivational enhancement framework that we 
often adopt with uh, substance use disorders. We don't want to underestimate the power of ambivalence a patient may have in this regard. Relapse is really common. It shouldn't be thought of as a good thing or a bad thing. It's something that just happens and is par for the course and is part of the natural course of a methamphetamine use disorder. Important to remind ourselves that our agenda as providers may not be the patient's agenda. It often isn't in the context of active use. Um, people are hearing what we say when they're ready, and we have to kind of have that patience and realize what we can control and what we can't in terms of engagement and a patient's um, progression towards readiness to address their meth use disorder. Next slide, please. Harm reduction approaches are really valuable. Many people aren't ready to stop, but will still engage in care. So people will show up regularly for visits, um, even if they're not ready to decrease or discontinue use. We can ask our patients what their bottom line is, what would lead them to think there's a problem with their use. We can encourage them to hydrate and eat regularly while they're using, even if they're not discontinuing their use per se. They can do fluoride rinses. They can use sugar-free hard candy or gum to prevent dental decay, for example. We can develop plans with them to ensure that they're still taking their medications during meth use. So someone can um, be on meds, antiretroviral medications for prevention or treatment of HIV, for example, while using meth. We can discuss PrEP with them if they're um, not living with HIV at the time. We can increase the frequency of screening for sexually transmitted infections, like the ones that I mentioned earlier. And we can also have conversations about safer sex and the ways that we typically do and uh, serial sorting to the extent that they are able to have control over that in terms of uh, partners that they engage in sexually. Next slide, please, yeah. Now, what eventually brings people using crystal meth into recovery? Serial conversion is one reason. Once people um, are living with HIV, that can be a reason to, to engage in recovery efforts. Um, work performance declining or losing one's job can be a motivating factor. Losing relationships or family that are really dear to a person can drive someone into um, recovery. Deep feelings of shame about use can often be motivating. And not that we want to add to their shame, but the shame that they experience in their own life is something that can often lead to engagement in, in recovery services. Uh, being terrified, frankly, about the psychosis that meth induces is also a motivating factor. Uh, knowing that their HIV is not well controlled, that they're not adherent to their antiretroviral treatment regimen for HIV can um, be a motivating factor. And having a really strong, sustained, trusting relationship with their primary treatment team can eventually be a factor that drives people into recovery as well. Next slide, please. It's really important to understand the extent to which meth use is connected to shame around sexuality and sexual behavior for uh, specific LGBTQI plus communities. It's important to deal with issues of shame and sex, which really is you know, underlying a lot of this. Um, people are wanting to uh, experiment sexually with multiple partners, have uh, receptive sex, sex without condoms or on PrEP, and meth is a way to avoid a lot of the feelings that could be worked through in this regard. People also are seeing sexual activity depicted online in ways that um, are different from the reality of their life and often are um, things that people uh, desire engaging in, but are you know, using meth as a way to, to uh, experience disinhibition that would allow them to do so. Sex and sobriety can feel really boring to people. Adam talked about this really nicely in the, in the previous segment. And um, that can be really triggering for people and can feel less intimate as well. Next slide, please. So Adam reviewed this really nicely. I won't go into um, too much detail about it, but there have been some recent uh, systematic reviews looking at pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions for methamphetamine use disorders. With regard to pharmacological treatment, um, we don't have great medications for maintenance of sobriety for methamphetamine like we do for opioid use disorders, for example, where we have buprenorphine and methadone that are like fabulous, you know, knocking it out of the park kind of uh, medications for maintenance of sobriety. I wish we had that for meth. There are mixed or weak positive signals, um, generally some more consistent signals with stimulant agonist treatments, actually uh, dexamphetamine and methylphenidate. So some of the um, you know, stimulants that we use for ADHD are 
found to be um, somewhat effective in this regard. Naltrexone and topiramate uh, have decent data. Uh, naltrexone we use for sobriety from uh, opioids and alcohol, for example. Uh, topiramate is uh, an anticonvulsant that we use for um, treatment of bipolar disorder and has some decent data. Not fabulous, though. Really, the better treatments are, like Adam was saying, the non-pharmacological ones. And um, these have some treatment efficacy in promoting abstinence, reducing use or decreasing cravings, and uh, behavioral interventions, contingency management, residential treatment, repetitive uh, TMS. It has some good data. And then the matrix model, which Adam talked about really nicely as well. Next slide, please. As Adam mentioned, we're doing some um, exciting dissemination work together. We have a large federally funded um, initiative supported by HRSA through the HIV AIDS Bureau to uh, implement emerging interventions for people living with HIV in four focus areas. And one of those four focus areas is substance use disorders. We convened national experts, uh, advisory council to select uh, the most promising and effective uh, emerging interventions for substance use disorders for people with HIV. And we really scoured the literature in this regard to look at emerging interventions. And one of the two best ones for really any type of substance use disorder that we selected was specifically um, what Adam talked about in terms of our tennis, this positive affect intervention that we're now very excited to be implementing nationally uh, in the Ryan White HIV AIDS program and at some uh, duly funded health centers that have both Ryan White funding and um, health center funding. And this focuses on improving mood states to boost effectiveness of community-based contingency management intervention for uh, stimulant abstinence among methamphetamine use disorders to achieve reductions in HIV viral load. And this positive affect uh, intervention focuses on positive event noting, uh, capitalizing on positive events, gratitude, informal and formal mindfulness, positive reappraisal of experiences, personal strengths, attainable goals, and acts of kindness or altruism. Next slide, please. People of different skill levels can implement this, which is part of the beauty of it. It augments contingency management, which is a really key component, a compelling way with these increased payments for non-reactive urine drug screens um, performed three times a week, like Adam was saying, for a period of 12 weeks. Data indicate um, that the impact on reducing or improving urologic suppression is very strong, and it's applicable more broadly than to just men who have sex with men. And more broadly than to crystal meth per se. So it can be used for other stimulants like cocaine, which is a really nice advantage. Next slide, please. So what does recovery look like? There's this you know, tension between extreme commitment and ambivalence. And many people are operating in this ambivalent space or in the recovery journey. There's the challenge of dealing with um, roles of partners and family in this regard, right? And uh, they play a really critical role if we're able to engage them. And that investment in the well being of their loved one with a methamphetamine use disorder goes a long way. Inpatient hospitalization is often not an option. So, inpatient units will often not um, hospitalize people with a methamphetamine use disorder because there's no um, risk of uh, potentially fatal withdrawal like we have with alcohol use disorders, for example. And um, you know, in, unless there's active psychosis and the person could be hospitalized for the active psychosis, it can be difficult at times to get an inpatient hospitalization, even though that would be a way to engage the person in the recovery process. So that's kind of a systems level limitation within the field of psychiatry where inpatient care is often not available where it could be beneficial. There are individual and group therapy approaches that are beneficial. Motivational enhancement can be helpful at different points in this recovery process. There are some nice partial hospitalization programs. Here in Boston, for example, we have a partial program that's specific for methamphetamine use disorders, and that uses um, evidence-based interventions like what Adam and his team have, have innovated. There are um, organizations that are helpful for people on the recovery journal, on the recovery journey, like Crystal Meth Anonymous. AA can be helpful. Narcotics Anonymous can be helpful. Tweaker.org is a great resource as well. Next slide, please. And early sobriety is often turbulent. Uh, seroconversion, as I mentioned, can help people enter recovery, but it can also be a trigger to use and to relapse. Um, initially, partners and family can be supportive, and that's valuable when it happens, as I was saying earlier. But when the initial crisis is over, it can change, you know, and people may not remain as acutely supportive as they are in the early phase of, of sobriety. 
people need time and recovery. We can't you know, expect this to happen as quickly as we would like. And relapse can happen even after a year out from initiating a recovery journey in this way. Next slide, please. Thanks for your time. Here's my contact information. And I believe we have about 15 minutes for um, discussion. So I'll turn it back over to Pedro. Thank you all so much for the great uh, presentations and discussions um, on this topic. Uh, we're just going to have a few questions. We have some that folks have submitted prior. And there's also one that Adam answered, but I'll just say it. Uh, loudly just in case uh, other folks didn't get a chance to read just so you maybe be able to comment to Alex if you want to give a little bit more details on math induced psychosis sure the question which I apologize I didn't see it's okay uh, that's it it's just if you could give oh, a little bit more details. psychosis sure yeah 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 so we'll often see with Matthews unfortunately people develop um psychosis with a variety of symptoms. People will often get uh, very paranoid and have paranoid delusions. They'll um, have hallucinations, including auditory hallucinations. They may hear voices or um, visual hallucinations can occur as well. I've had some clinically tricky situations where you know, someone's using that has in fact been letting people into their home and people have you know robbed them or taken stuff um, from their apartment and it's hard for me to tell when there's active you know paranoid delusions in the mix like what really happened what didn't happen are they really being pursued or threatened um you know are people still coming into their home are they not so be because meth use behaviorally leads to such impairment and judgment and um can lead to a lot of chaos in a person's life and can lead to violence and a range of really scary things it can be hard to tease apart what's real that's happening that's scary in what ways is the person in you know physically in danger and what is um, um grounded in psychosis and, and delusional so if the delusions are much more bizarre like things that couldn't possibly happen in reality that is clearer but it's often you know this very fine line between what sounds like it's plausible and what is uh delusional and that makes it really hard to engage in any kind of planning with the patient but the you know the key thing is to try to get them into treatment and uh, antipsychotic medications are the standard for that certainly to address the um, psychotic symptoms and it can take many weeks uh, it's pretty astounding how persistent the psychosis can be after discontinuing meth use cool thank you so much um, and we also have another question um, about uh, so I'll just read the question. Can you please address the intersection of sex and math, both both socially and in the brain? Thanks. Sure, uh, Adam. A little bit more. Right? Yeah. I mean, um, in the brain, uh, it, it's fascinating in that sex and meth uh, both target the dopamine reward system. So you're, you're engaging in a reinforcing behavior anyway that's then amplified by uh, meth use. Uh, and so it's just highly reinforcing, highly um, stimulating. Um, like Alex was saying, we often hear the best sex uh, someone has ever had. Uh, people often find it hard to have sober sex and that's a, a major part of their recovery is you know learning how to be sexual and have sexual um, feelings and behaviors and interactions uh, off drug. Um, and that can take years. Uh, and it's, uh, I think, the most uh, difficult part of uh, recovery. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, the challenge is that it can be difficult to have and enjoy sex afterwards on two fronts. There's what's happened in terms of reward circuitry and not being able to get uh, stimulated or excited uh, from a neurological standpoint in the way that you used to. And then there's the cardiovascular damage that's occurred, including erectile dysfunction that, you know, can be rooted in uh, not just neurological, but cardiovascular damage that's permanent. And that's a really big loss for people who, um, you know, often prior to initiating meth use were uh, really struggling with feelings of shame about their um, sexuality, about their performance sexually, and about how accepted they were within a community where really the kind of identity and organizing principle is around 
um, attraction and, and sexuality and, and intimacy. So um, there's a lot that people grieve afterwards. And in addition to learning how to engage in, you know, uh, and have a sexual and intimate life, there can be um, real challenges in terms of self-esteem that uh, can emerge mm -hmm. and persist. It's interesting you talk about the cardiovascular effects. I mean, we're seeing some of that in our, our data. Even um, we use ultra-sensitive C-troponin levels, and we're seeing those higher in, um, or detectable and higher in our meth users with HIV in particular, that co-occurrence. Um, but it feels like uh, one of the things that's missing now is that much of our prevention campaigns have been around don't do meth, you'll get HIV, right? And in the era of biomedical prevention and working with many men living with HIV, they say, okay, that's off the table, right? And so, you know, we're, we're not talking about the mental health consequences, the social, you know, and financial effects and other important health effects. Like I think if guys knew that it impacts their erectile function long-term, that might, you know, change their calculus around using. So, we need to have that broader view of like what what meth prevention needs to entail. Yeah, and it's amazing to me how little we talk about the um, the sheer breadth of severe physical health problems that emerge. Um, it, we we cannot we should keep talking at him about how we can um, have public health campaigns that are more kind of comprehensive and effective in those ways. Because I agree, what we used to focus on is is not as much of a concern to the community as it once was. Thank you. Um, and great point. I never thought about it. Um, there are some questions about finding resources. Uh, and Alex, you might be more familiar with uh, finding resources in specifically rural areas, since I know like Fenway has done some work with uh, in, in the interior part of New England. So um, do you, both of you, do you have any uh, sort of advice for health centers that may, you know, not have like amazing resources and are trying to give objective advice to patients or even trying to seek help for the centers um, in general? Well, I'm really excited about some of the um, app-based and other innovations, Adam, that you were sharing that seem like they could have some real rural non-urban reach. Yeah, and I think we're in an era, you know, where there's increasing recognition of telehealth and working across state lines. And I would just love for, you know, people in non-urban centers or, you know, where there isn't a Fenway or there isn't like a Stonewall project yeah. to be able to access those services via remote, um, at least through counseling. Um, but that I, that concept of reach, I think, is so important, um, and it's really provocative for us. I mean, we work on um, the Amethyst cohort delivering HIV results, uh, largely to men using meth, um, just across the U.S., right? And, you know, um, it just the, the profoundness of their isolation and um, is, is palpable uh, outside of the major urban centers. Not that it's ever easy to get an HIV diagnosis, but you just feel the uh, the desperation in many instances. Yeah, and there's you know there's Crystal Meth Anonymous. Um, there there's uh, NA which can be helpful. I think that the one of the interesting things um, geographically and sociologically is that there are parts of the country where this is less the case now because unfortunately it's like much of the country, but. Um, still, to some extent, there are parts of the country where there's much more meth use, not necessarily among men who have sex with men. Historically, that's been in uh, the Midwest, the Southwest, the West Coast, and, you know, Massachusetts until two years ago, it was really among MSM that we saw meth use, and there was not a meth a problem in the broader population in the same way. We had an opioid epidemic here before anyone was talking about the opioid epidemic nationally. But so there are like geographic trends in terms of where certain substances get used. As a result of that, I think in some rural parts of the country where there's actually quite a bit of meth use, it's not necessarily primarily among MSM or among queer communities. So in some of these services or um, sobriety meetings and, and programming, it may not be as culturally responsive specifically to the needs of uh, LGBTQ plus people. So that can be a, an overlay to consider. Is this 
um, recovery service that you're referring someone to or meth focused program, if there's one which is great, to what extent is that going to be inclusive, welcoming, affirming of and, and skilled in meeting the needs of MSM, for example? Yeah. And I guess if I was trying to case manage someone or get them into a good referral, I, I would just encourage them to be ex experimental, right? That this is not going to be just like a, you go and it's going to be a good fit, even if you're going to like Fenway or Stonewall. I mean, you, you have to find the right fit for you and uh, and just trying one, one more time, trying another option, like uh, keep at it because that is what we know really helps people in the end to uh, to keep trying. Great. Um, we don't have any additional questions, so I don't want to force anyone. <laughs> um, I think, Emily, do you have any final words? I just want to thank you, Alex and Adam. This has been great. Maybe there was one question that came through here at the end. Let me see. Oh, yes, there is one final question. So we have time for it. Um, what work is being done to build capacity in the South and Midwest uh, culture to build culturally competent care? Uh, this is somebody that provides telehealth in Oklahoma, and there's a high need of what you were talking about there. Yeah. Well, I can say, you know, Adam's intervention that he described, which is really brilliant, and as far as we can tell in our advisory council determined, um, the most promising emerging intervention out there. We're currently piloting at several sites around the country that are HRSA funded for people with HIV. And we're then gonna develop, as we did on the last round with this type of intervention through the HIV AIDS Bureau, uh, multi-component multimedia toolkit that'll be available for free on the Target HIV website. And that will really be something any health center can pick up off the shelf, so to speak, online and use to implement this intervention. So we're, our goal is really to scale Adam's intervention up nationally, and we're working very closely with him and his team in that regard. That's one thing at least that HRSA is doing, uh, recognizing that we have not focused enough on interventions for methamphetamine use disorders, specifically among people with HIV. There's been more work around opioid use disorders and alcohol, but meth has really not been focused on in the same way, and it's hardening to see HRSA prioritized this from a policy and, and uh, implementation standpoint. Adam, I don't know if you have other. No, I, I guess I would just say there are enduring structural and policy barriers in the Southern United States. I mean, I'm in Florida and uh, I'm sure all of you have seen the news, right? And um, and I think, you know, we need to continue to advocate for these services at a local level, at a state level, uh, that there be set aside, that our states buy into the Medicaid expansion. I mean, there, uh, there are fundamental structural problems that are driving the HIV epidemic in the South and its disproportionate in impact on racial and ethnic minority uh, MSM in particular, but in transgender women. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the solutions to that are going to be much harder than scaling out treatment. Um, one of the cool things about the positive affect intervention, though, is it does not really require culturally competent care in some ways. Like we don't talk about sex. We don't talk about, you know, uh, many things that would might make uh, men and providers uncomfortable. But I think people do need to approach that counseling interaction in a way that is just authentic and accepting and understanding of you know where men are at in their lives um, but the actual skills and the content i think are much more palatable and don't require a lot of like good grasp of like uh, sexual risk reduction for example um, so maybe that will make it easier to disseminate for some um, i'm hoping Great, thank you all so much. I'm gonna pass it the ball over to Emily, our MC. And I just wanna thank everybody one more time, thanks. Yeah, thank you all. That was such a great presentation. I really enjoyed learning a lot today. Um, and we do wanna thank all of our guests for attending as well. <clears throat> we do recognize that your time is very valuable and it was an honor having you all on this webinar today. Um, the webinar was recorded, so a link will be sent out post-event. And thank you all for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.